everybody, and welcome to another comics-loving, comic-centered episode of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted to be joined on this episode by comics creator Tom Zoller. Tom, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, my, absolutely my pleasure. I'm always delighted to talk to people that do visual works and uh, it was a big part of my reading life growing up, and I continue to enjoy the work that you do. I mentioned Love and Capes, Cupid's Arrows. Um, yeah, very creative, and I love the style that you you bring to that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what was it about comics? Were you a comics reader as a kid? Is this something that came up um, through the years? What was your journey like? I have no memory of not reading comics. Um, my dad taught me to read at a really early age. I was reading like two and a half and he used them as a reward system. So nice. I cleaned my room, got a comic. Um, so I got a lot of comics and my parent, my dad had done a little bit of art. My aunt had done a little bit of art, but it was always kind of an option in my family. So it didn't feel like I'm going into art. Nobody's ever done that before. It was, Oh, well that is a job that people have. And um it took some convincing on a couple parts, but mostly it was that kind of going into the NBA. There's always a new crop of people, but it's really hard to be part of that crop. Um, so yeah, it was just it was just always an option. I I don't remember not reading comics. I don't remember not wanting to be a cartoonist. That's this is all I've wanted to do. Nice, nice, uh, and yeah. I have a similar story of comics were just always kind of there, at least from mm -hmm. the age of six or seven. Um, so definitely a, a part of reading life. And then, so you, one of the things I, I mentioned already is the style that you bring to the books that you do. Are there any particular influences or inspirations? How, how did you kind of develop your, your style? Oh, I, uh, I fought against it. I really wanted to be George Perez or Kurt Swan. Yeah, um, yeah. Those were my favorites growing up. Um, I didn't realize that I kind of moved more towards like Kurt Schaffenberger in my style uh, back back when I was at Qbert. And I always inked heavy, like I inked, I had a Ty Templeton line quality. It was very, it was cartoony inks and I was trying to do realistic art. Um, but when Batman the Animated Series came out, suddenly it validated like, that style could work for anything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And once I did that, it was like, oh, I just got to hit this inside fastball all the time. Like I, I didn't realize that was my natural inclination, but when I realized that that's when things started clicking. Yeah. I, I also, I appreciate George Perez, but the Batman adventures and, you know, the, the subsequent books through that series and, and they continue now. Um, was just such a landmark reading for me as a kid and, and love that Ty Templeton mm -hmm. kind of style. Yeah. yeah. He he's done a written interview with me, but uh, I don't know that he's doing audio podcasts anymore, but okay. yeah, that's, and that's probably, as you say that uh, probably one of the reasons that I'm drawn to it because I love that, like Bruce, Tim, Ty Templeton. Yeah. Uh, Darwin kind Cook. Of approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, absolutely. There's a Darwin Cook piece right behind me. He did a cover for love and caves. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, so speaking of that, I, I was going to ask, and this is not officially on the list, so you're welcome to pass it's okay. uh, if you want, but just thinking about uh, as you've been in the industry and as you've worked with folks, are there, are there people that you found to be particularly positive collaborators, positive relationships in the, the comics world? Um, relationships, yes. Collaborators, that feels a little dicier just because I tend to work alone. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Uh, I do. I super love working with Tony Fleece and um, uh, Andy Price on My Little Pony. Um, My Little Pony is the book that I've collaborated on the most. And that has been, it's diff different for me. It's an interesting experience because mostly what I did before doing Love and Capes and Raider and all that stuff was lettering. And while that is collaborative, you're like the last person on the totem pole and there's not a lot of places to interact. But Tony was the one who would call out my scripts and more than my editor sometimes and say, oh, you can write a funnier joke than that. I'm like, hmm, yeah, you're right. Um, I like having that kind of honesty where yeah, yeah. where, you know, it's coming from a place of someone like you completely trust the source that's telling you stuff and they know when to pull that card and when not to pull that card. Uh -huh. 
Um, but relationships, oh, so many. Um, Tony Isabella and Bob Ingersoll are friends. My Tony, I approached at a comic book convention in the eighties and asked him if he needed an apprentice. And that's how I got to know him. Uh, nice. He was like, the, he lives in Cleveland and is the first comics professional that I ever really got to meet. Um, man, uh, Paul Story is a really good friend of mine. He's a comic book writer. Uh, mm-hmm. We bounce things back and forth a bunch. Luke Dobb, who's an illustrator. Um, like I said, Tony and Andy, and I'm sure there are more that I am forgetting. Um, but yeah, like, because it's weird. You come in with people who are like at your level and you can deal with them in one level. And then there are people who are above you and then you become friends with them. And that's awesome and weird. And um, I was friends with Dwayne McDuffie. And, yeah. But I was better friends with his wife. Like there, there was this one year at San Diego that she and I and a bunch of animation writers were all hanging out at a fire pit outside the animation party that year. And we were all coming up at the same time. So when I was trying to do an animation script, I would send it to Charlotte. I would send it to Eugene. But it felt weird to send it to Dwayne because even though I knew him, it was like that was one level above. And uh, I remember talking to him at a free comic book day event and I went to use the bathroom and I came back and Dwayne's like, what's this I hear about you having a spec script? I haven't read yet. And just called me out on it and took the script. So, yeah, the, there there's lots of relationships like that. Like it it weirds me out that I can talk to Walter Simonson. And a lot of times we just talk about like NCIS or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I've had very brief, you know, as a fan, as a, a comics convention attender, very brief interactions with Walter Simonson, but he just seems to be just a kind soul, just a oh, kind yeah. person. Yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned someone else there that I was going to touch on, but oh, you mentioned My Little Pony. And oh, I was yeah. going to say, as, as an educator, I'm always looking for recommendations for teachers. And that's one of those books that, you know, the power of comics and graphic novels, I'm just going to put out there for teachers that um, link with popular culture and things that was huge for me as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I didn't find that a lot at school. So I uh, just want to hat tip the the work you've done on that as well. And then um, so Love and Capes, Cupid's Arrows, those are I, I appreciate the humor. You mentioned oh, humor you. as well. Yeah. Uh, always enjoy a good book that takes me out of reality a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um and so I appreciate that. Anything that you want to share with listeners about those two series or those two books or any other um, titles that you'd like to to mention? So, so I did a book called Raider that I did before Love and Capes. And the third volume has a character interaction between the main character and his femme fatale villain. And I found I really liked writing the banter between them. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like, you know, realizing I could draw cartoony is like, oh, I really like this. This is fun. I can do this. Um, so when I set out on my next project after a Raider blew up, I'm like, well, I want something shorter. I want to do one issue. I want to do something lighter. And uh, I had actually, there was a show on Bravo called Situation Comedy. And it was like Project Greenlight for sitcoms. And uh-huh. I had two ideas for, for a script. One was Love and Capes and one was something called Long Distance, which I eventually did too. Um, but I kind of... Uh, shook the cobwebs off writing a long distance script and then decided to do love and capes as a comic book and i wanted to do i mean i love the silver age bronze age superhero stuff i mean i'm justice league satellite era all the way but i i don't as an independent creator i don't want to do the books that dc and marvel are doing because they're doing the books and they're doing you know i can't do a better superman book than dc but i can do a character i can do characters that are having a successful relationship because nobody's doing that uh, especially in 2005 2006 when i started so it was kind of that hit them where they ain't uh i wanted to do something you know you're as an independent you're trying to do something that people aren't that um means something to you because you just you need to carve out a niche and then i've just fell into writing romance themed comics um of one sort or another ever since uh love and capes got me my little pony um and then idw did long distance and we did time and vine which i'm i'm a big fan of uh and then that stuff brought me to webtoon and in comics i'm kind of a utility infielder where like i'm solid but you know i'm i'm pretty much journeyman 
uh, creator. But when you go to Webtoon and you're like, well, I'm a romances, they're like, oh, you're a left-handed reliever. This is great. Um, and I think there are lots of reasons for it. Like uh, Webtoon tend to have vertical scroll. And I think that lends itself to relationship stuff because you lose vistas. You can't do anything horizontal. It's all vertical. Um, so as a result, like the characters are a lot, they're talking to each other a lot more like it's built for that. Um, I remember when the pandemic hit and I was working on the the last season of Cupid's Arrows, I made an announcement when it happened that the pandemic was not going to happen in the comic. Uh, one, because I just don't want to deal with it. But two, because there's no way to socially distance characters on a Webtoon platform. Uh, you can't okay. you can't put six feet between them when you've only got the width of an iPhone screen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. And you mentioned time and vine. Um, love the a wine centric mm -hmm. comic, which is uh, I mean, for folks that don't know, there's so much that that is happening in comics. And there's a long history of the romantic comics in different ways. But but I like the way you kind of take different genres and blend them together for those two for love yeah. and tapes comics used to have a lot more genres when they were aiming at a larger audience and i think um this is my um theory on it it became really easy to target so you targeted the people who were responding the most but mm -hmm. that let so you weren't trying to shoot at a large crowd you were trying to hit exactly the places you want, but that made it easier to give up on romance comics or the war comics or the horror comics and just do superheroes because those were the things that were resonating with people and build out from there. Um, but I think, yeah, there's just so much that comics can do. Um, and like, I like the part where, you know, for writing a, Love and Capes is essentially a sitcom, but I don't have to worry about actors. Like if I need a character to come back after eight issues, like they're not doing another series. You know, nobody's leaving the show because they have a drug plot problem. Like, it, you know, they're, I feel I, as much as I'd like to see anything I've done adapted, I want to write the best version of the thing that I can. Like, it's got to be a good comic book first. And then if something happens with it, something happens with it. But I don't want, you know, it's not a pitch on paper. And there's things you can do in comics that you can only do in comics. Like the way comics deal with time is so weird because it's all space. Like you can write a 24 page comic that takes place over 10 minutes. You can write a 24 page comic that takes place over 10 years. Um, but when you're dealing with TV or movies, like the, the time is actually the time and um, yeah. it just gives you different things that you can do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's one of the things that I love about comics too. It's just the, the uniqueness that they have mm -hmm. uh, for representing ideas and that those getters and panels and, and the things you can kind of play with back and forth. Yeah, there's um, one of like the there's a little thing I did in um, Cupid's Arrows that I really liked, and like it, it's um, like I know it's been done before, but there are two. There's a the Cupids go and they try to get a couple together that are working on uh, like a, a 48 hour play pr festival project um, or a short play festival, and anytime they're speaking dialogue, they're the font changes to something that's serif. It's um, Pulp Fiction from um, uh, the Comic Craft Store. But it's just a, such a subtle little thing. But when you do it, it like people get it a lot faster. Like it seems super clever. And then when you do it, it just reads naturally to people. And I, you know, that kind of stuff you can do in a way that you can't do, you know, in, in reality. Yeah. Uh, and even with the typography alone, I mean, the lettering, it's like there are so many things you can kind of play with, like when characters interrupt each other or, mm -hmm. um, you know, if someone says something in a really icy way, the the word balloon kind of has spikes on it or, you know, all of those kind of things yep. that you can have fun with. Um, so before I ask the the final question on the list and give you space to talk about anything else i'm I'm just gonna recognize for people that might be watching a video version of this loving the studio space oh thank love you love it when i see uh an artist's studio so really enjoying that as well what character is that way back there is that um, figment oh uh, yeah yeah disney yeah yes i thought so yeah love it love it yeah and um, a couple shogun warriors back there nice good to have a, a creative space where the ideas flow yeah i uh i did a lot to build it um when you're looking at it, you see that there's brick but actually most of the brick is fake 
Um, oh. There's there's two real brick pillars in the studio. There's one in that corner and there's one in front of me. And when I bought the house, like I, it was one of those weird things where like it, like this room came to me fully formed. Mm -hmm. And initially, like it's all natural textures. Like my desk is glass and metal and my, you know, it's brick walls and hardwood floor. And it's actually in my head designed like Michael Weissman's apartment or from uh, now and again, this yeah, uh, yeah. Night 2000 show that I adore that uh, got canceled. Um, but I wanted, when I was at Qbert, they, they said, don't do anything at your drawing table aside from draw, um, which was hard because when you were in the dorms or in the apartment, you didn't have a lot of furniture. But the idea was to get you into the mindset that every time you sit at the workspace, what you do is work. So along the same way, I built the studio so that it was different than every other room in the house. Like the rest of the house was carpeted and painted and all normal stuff. Um, and this room was built to be so visually different that I clicked over to work mode anytime I walked into it. Nice. Yeah. Love it. And again, appreciating the, the artwork there as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the last official question, and then you're welcome to throw in anything that you want. Uh, okay deals with anything upcoming that you want to talk about anything that's in development that's currently on the table as well as conventions because uh, oh I know yeah I'll, I'll be stopping by your table in a, about a week from now yes i am uh, apparently at every convention on the planet um so i'm doing a project for storm king that hasn't been announced yet i have uh like 20 pages left to draw on that so nice, uh, nice. hopefully i can talk about that soon um, i'm drawing mo lang for source point uh, which is based on the, I guess it's French, but it looks Japanese. Um, so that's really cute. Uh, and I'm slowly putting together the uh, volume two of Cupid's Arrows. I'm behind on everything because, and I think we're on the good side of it, but both my parents had health adventures in the last couple of months. Um, and that kind of knocked me out of the studio for a while. Uh, my brothers and I pulled together and it was great. And I'm so glad to have family nearby, but it really... Uh, it messed up my flow for a bit. Uh, it's why I was supposed to do a My Little Pony convention in San Francisco and had to cancel at the last minute. Um, and then for conventions, the ones that have been announced, because one big one that I really want to talk about, but it has been announced and I don't want to get in front of it. Um, get you, I'll be, get you. Yeah, I'll be, it'll, it'll be international though. So I'll tell you that much because I am I did a My Little Pony convention in Holland last year and I got to go to Europe really for the first. I had been to um, Ireland about 20 years ago. I still have relatives out there. But I hadn't been to London or Paris or Bruges or uh, Amsterdam, and I just adored being able to take that trip. And I'm going to get to take another one like that next uh, this year. Um, I'll be at Heroes Con um, yes, yes. coming up next week. Yeah, in Charlotte as well. Uh, I, lo yeah. Love Heroes Con. It's such an art heavy show. Um, and then I'll be in Fan Expo Denver, uh, where one of my brothers lives. So I always go try to do that show. I'll be at the Batan Death March that is San Diego um which i i love but it's a lot of work like that's the big one um yeah. and then uh dragon con baltimore i love baltimore love dragon con uh they're they're both very different shows baltimore is my unofficial home show um, oh yeah 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 and then uh dragon con is just so much fun it's the only show i dress up at uh and i did that for the first time last year uh because since i'm in my uh silver fox years i've decided that i uh can do the pike so oh nice um, nice love it yeah yeah um and then probably uh new york that's not official but new york the, the convention i'm not talking about in grand rapids i think that's it um i'm trying to cut back on the number of shows i do um one of the things i learned during the pandemic is that i bought a house and i like it um yes like yeah I, true i've been away from it for so long uh but every time i try to not do shows then like opportunities i can't say no to show up so, but I'd like to keep it about one a month. And then there's that weird period from like September to October where it's just shows all the way down. Yeah, I, I've heard such good things about Baltimore. I'm going to have to make yeah, it out that way sometime. It is a, uh, um, it is very much a comic book show, which I appreciate. Like they bring in just enough media guests to make it interesting, but not so much that they overwhelm um because especially when you're in a like a smaller market i think you have to be a couple more things to like I don't know, um in a larger area you can focus on one thing and get enough people in but in a place like columbus 
you need to have a show that's got actors and comic books because it's hard to it's hard to support that area you need something for everybody to come in for um and i think baltimore does a really good job balancing that um the guy who runs it is a friend of mine and i put together baltimore does a yearbook based on a theme every year uh they've done strangers in paradise and archie and um uh grendel and david peterson's mouse guard all sorts of stuff uh and this year they're doing independent creators of the 80s so it's going to be sable i'm going to forget somebody it's going to be sable and mars and e-man and american flag and nexus and the guy i'm forgetting uh grimjack oh yeah 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 so cool very yeah. cool love the creativity mm-hmm. um, and so i'll be seeing you i'll stop by your table here in about another week yeah in yeah, charlotte really. leave on thursday at stupid o'clock yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> iced coffee with no creamer is a great like shock to the system i'm just gonna recommend that if I, you're traveling you, overnight <laughs> you know i i go through all sorts of different ways of thinking about it uh, my flight is like at six in the morning um and then i fly through baltimore and part of me sometimes i think about what to do to wake up and i'm like no go to the flight tired like it'll be easier to fall asleep like there's a um i'm six four and like i fly the way wolverine's claws pop out like does it hurt every time um yeah like i'm just not built for this toy line and uh you know so anything i can do to not be awake for it is better for me it's nice yeah yeah love the reference there too love it um well well, those were my questions anything that i missed that you want to make sure to to share about as far as your work inspirations and also uh sending care for your family and glad that, that things are good and better now yeah. Uh, let's see. No, I got I got stuff out there. I like people to read. Uh, Warning Label is a great um, self-contained thing that is available on Amazon. Um, Time and Vine, I adore and was so much fun to do the reference on. Uh, yeah. It was yeah. one of those projects that came like almost fully formed, where when I came up with the idea, it's a time traveling winery where you drink a bo- go to the right tasting room, you drink a bottle from 1912, you go back to 1912. And I definitely wanted the story to take place in New York. I wanted it to be on the Eastern Seaboard because I wanted to do American history and you know from the from the founding of the country and be able to play with that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, well, has there been a winery that's been around for like, you know, I know the California wine scene is that you know was that a thing? And I'm like, no, the oldest continuously operating winery in the United States is in upstate New York, exactly where I needed it to be. And Love that. Uh, I got a book on it and then I went out and visited a couple times. Um, so much fun to do the research on that book. So yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, right now um, what I've been doing with love and capes is it appears on my Patreon page. So mm-hmm. I would generally do about a page a week. I did it um, as therapy during COVID. I brought the characters back after volume five and uh, had them going through COVID, but like three to six months in the past. So all, everything was accurate. Like I wasn't trying to guess where anything was going. I was dealing with what had happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I collected up in a Kickstarter and then I did a Christmas one home for the holidays. Uh, I'm putting other stuff on Patreon right now. And then eventually, eventually I will go back and do love and capes that way again, because I left the last um, holiday volume in such a place where there are definitely more stories to be told. I haven't figured out what any of them are, but I left myself a lot of stuff to play with. Very, very so. cool. Very cool. I love the idea of writing and creating as uh, therapy. And uh, do you have any wine pairings with Time and Vine? Any recommended oh. wine pairings? Uh, I don't know that that's a thing anymore. I think you can kind of mix it up as you like, but yeah. anything that works uh, works well. I, I don't know. Uh, it would, I would drink just about anything with it. Um, I bought yeah. when I, I signed a particularly big contract a few years ago and I bought a six pack of Skywalker wine, uh, George yeah. Lucas's wine. That oh, was a nice. lot of fun. Nice. And I'm a member of um, Stephen Amell's wine club, Knocking Point. And they, they ship some really nice stuff out uh, every now and then. I, I mean, it's a three month. I mean, it's a three month. Uh, subscription so i get three bottles every every three months and it's just like he's a lot of fun and the wines are a lot of fun and a lot of times they pair up with different actors there's one that jason momoa worked on um just all sorts of stuff that uh yeah it's just it's fun to get in the mail yeah yeah that's cool that's cool i'll have to look into that um well wonderful conversation thank you for 
for dropping by, zooming in, however we want to say that, and always glad <laughs> My to share pleasure. about your work. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for agreeing to come on. Sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, talk again soon and see you soon. All right. Sounds good.